previously on Riot Watches. Uh, you want some advice? Here's the rock's advice. Shut your mouth! You take us to Hollywood, or I stab you both to death on my own front fucking lawn! Alright. For my next trick! I'm gonna fucking kill myself. God, Eat shit. How's that? Eat shit. Eat shit. Eat shit. Smug smile. Definitely eat shit. This is me. This is how I went. I gotta tell you, I've been looking forward to meeting you for a long time. I'm a huge fan. You're such a dick! Every day I wake up and I hope you're dead! Damn it, Tony! I can't talk too long. I gotta poo. Here we go! This is no joke, no exaggeration, the hardest top 10 list I ever had to rank. This year ruled so hard. Let's get to number 10. Number 10. Alita Battle Angel. Alita Battle Angel is the film that keeps on giving. This film is a throwback to the blockbusters of the 90s, which makes sense given James Cameron is a producer on this. This film was hands down the best film I saw in 3D since Doctor Strange. And my god, is Doctor Strange 2 going to suck? With some of the best action set pieces this year, breathtaking visual effects, and some of the best world building I've seen in a film this year, and Rosa Salazar's fantastic performance as the titular Alita, which I really hope she doesn't keep getting typecast. I want to see more of Iron City. Disney, release a sequel, you fucking cowards. Number 9. The Farewell. The Farewell is the film that should have had the Crazy Rich Asians hype behind it. A film that is on paper a depressing premise turns out to be one of the most wonderful films of the year. Aquafina is an absolute revelation in this film as she feels genuinely conflicted about how her family wants to keep Nai Nai's cancer a secret. Though the film has a predominantly Asian cast, the themes explored in this film are universal, be it the fear of death, trying to find your identity, and reconnecting with your family. Writer and director Lulu Wang is an exciting talent that I can't wait to see more of. Her attention to detail, her fantastic production design, her sharp and witty writing is genuinely great. Also, I'm eagerly awaiting the Binging with Babish episode on this film. Number 8. Ready or Not. In 2017, I put a little C Netflix movie on my top 10 favorite films list called The Babysitter. If you love that movie, then you will love Ready or Not. What Blumhouse's Trooper Dare should have been, Ready or Not is a horror film that doesn't take itself too seriously. The film is equal parts horrifying and hilarious, and Samara Weaving is fucking awesome in this film. Radio Silence makes a fantastic feature film debut, and I want to see where they go from here. The production design of this film is nothing short of astounding. The timing of the comedy is perfect. The kills are surprisingly brilliant and creative. My own personal headcanon is that this is the direct sequel to The Babysitter, where Bee gets a taste of her own medicine. Seriously, I want to see what Radio Silence does next as filmmakers. I also saw that McGee is doing a babysitter too, and the lack of Samara weaving has me worried about it. Number 7 
Shazam and Joker. You put Joker in your top ten? You're a racist and a sexist! Might as well address the elephant in the room. Security concerns surrounding the new Joker movie, the FBI, the LAPD, among those taking action. Warner Brothers Studio and its film Joker has become part of the gun safety debate. It is a film creating critical acclaim and Oscar buzz, along with controversy and outrage. I avoided talking about the controversy in my initial review of Joker, but I'm just going to say it. Joker deserved all 11 of its Oscar nominations. Sorry, not sorry. Fool this man! The fact remains is that every award season, elitist film critics pick the Best Picture nominee to dunk on. While some are warranted, some aren't. It's also usually the film that has the widest release of the Best Picture nominees. What better film than the film that's been dunked on by elitist film critics since it won the prestigious Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival? The film that got I Refuse to Do My Job think pieces from entitled millennial film critics who count every time a woman speaks in a Tarantino film. It isn't just Joker. Now that 1917 dethroned the rise of Skywalker with an impressive $36.5 million weekend, film journalists are starting to dunk on that film as well. Again, another film that doesn't deserve the hate it's getting. Congratulations! Every single one of you entitled film journalists just proved Arthur Fleck right. You decide what's right or wrong the same way that you decide what's funny or not. You were all salivating at the thought of innocent lives being taken at a screening of Joker just so you could get your precious fucking clicks. But the violence didn't break out at Joker. All of you were fucking silent when a machete fight broke out during Frozen 2 just so you could get your precious press pass to see Disney take a massive dump on the Skywalker saga. That being said... Why did I decide to make these two films a tie? Because it's my list, that's why. That and both of these films have a lie in common. Both films are DC properties. Both films are directed by filmmakers who are first and foremost known for other genres. David S. Sandberg with horror and Todd Phillips with R-rated comedies. Both films are medium budget films. But more importantly, both films do a great job in exploring what a person does when the cards are stacked against them. In Shazam, Billy Batson finds out his mother abandoned him on purpose and chooses to use his power for good. In Joker, Arthur Fleck is taunted and bullied and chooses to make a bold statement on a talk show that mocked him. I love both of these films equally for what they did with their source material. By the way, I'm just going to say it right now. Shazam is the MCU Spider-Man movie I wanted and never got. Sorry, not sorry. Also, more Jokers and less Four Quadrant Focus Group approved MCU films, please. Number 6 Dolomite is my name. Remember when Netflix movies were a joke? Eddie Murphy returns to form in a huge way by chronicling the life of Dolomite creator Rudy Ray Moore. A film that is equal parts hilarious and inspirational, Dolomite Is My Name is a celebration of cult classics. I said this in my original review and I'll say it again. If you are in a local band, you need to watch this film and take notes. This film makes you want to pick up a camera and shoot. Allow me to get a little personal as to why this is in my top 10. I fell into a bit of a rut a couple months ago. I felt like nobody was caring about my work. This film single-handedly helped me get out of it, along with some help from some friends of mine. Thanks to Dolomite Is My Name, I was able to get out of my rut. This film will probably get shut out at the Oscars, and it's a goddamn shame, because this film deserves a lot of recognition, specifically Eddie Murphy. Number 5 the Lighthouse. Two things you should know about my film tastes. I love weird and I love bleak. The Lighthouse is both. Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson give career best performances in this film of two men who slowly go insane. 
Robert Eggers masterfully crafts this film using old techniques, and I really want to see this at least get nominated for technical awards. Between mermaid sex fantasies, fart jokes, and an impending sense of doom, The Lighthouse is a genuine work of art that I recommend seeing. I seriously can't wait to get my hands on the Blu-ray so I can look at the special features of this film. In fact, as I'm recording this right now, I already have the Blu-ray in my hand. Number 4 The Peanut Butter Falcon For all the talk of disability representation in Hollywood, Hollywood was really silent about the Peanut Butter Falcon. This should have been an Oscar contender, but it's barely getting a blip for awards consideration. It's a damn shame because this film is genuinely wonderful. With three great performances from Shia LaBeouf, Dakota Johnson, and the star of this film, Zach Gottsagan, this film put the biggest smile on my face. What I love about this film is Gottsagan's Zach is a character with his own goals and ambitions and doesn't let Down Syndrome get in the way. He is treated like an actual human being. Not everything has to be Joker or Uncut Gems. Sometimes you just need to watch a laid-back and amiable film that just makes you feel happy, and the Peanut Butter Falcon does exactly that. Seriously, seek this movie out. This deserved so much better this year. Number 3 Dr. Sleep Boy, did my comparison to Blade Runner 2049 ring true because this was another Warner Brothers back sequel that didn't deserve to bomb. Dr. Sleep was somehow able to balance the macabre tone of Stephen King's novels with Stanley Kubrick's vision of The Shining, hence the official title Stephen King's Dr. Sleep. In a decade chock full of Stephen King adaptations, this was my absolute favorite of the decade. With a villain that would make Pennywise shit his pants, and great character development both new and old, I loved everything about this film. Mike Flanagan is an absolute master of horror, writing, directing, and editing this fantastic film. Not only that, almost giving a Kubrickian vibe to it that I couldn't help but appreciate. Stanley Kubrick is up there smiling right now. Fuck the recent It movies and watch this instead. Number 2 The Irishman There's an exact reason why your favorite filmmakers are going to Netflix. Netflix is allowing for creative freedom. So it's no surprise that three Netflix movies showed up on my top 20 favorite films of 2019. The Irishman is Martin Scorsese firing on all cylinders. Scorsese takes his gangster film formula and flips it on its head to tell a sprawling and epic story of the man who killed Jimmy Hoffa. Not since JFK's director's cut has three and a half hours flown by so beautifully, using remarkable technology to the age De Niro, Pacino, and Pesci, The Irishman is an old-school Scorsese film with a modern touch. Unlike the MCU, The Irishman uses its de-aging technology not as a gimmick, but rather as a tool to tell a great story. Also, De Niro, Pacino, and Pesci all give career best performances in this fantastic film that takes a look at corruption, abandonment, and even mortality. The third act of this film is so powerful. When Frank Sheeran stares at that crypt, it gave me goosebumps. I really hope to see more Netflix films like this in the future. I seriously love the hell out of The Irishman. And my number one favorite film of 2019 is... Uh, you better give Avengers Endgame, like, the number one best film of 2019. Nope! Let's try that again. And my number one favorite film of 2019 is... The brother, the fed brother, the traveling... The one thing my top three favorite films all have in common is that they all run over two and a half hours long. It came down to one simple word. The operating word of this list is favorite. What is the one film that I will repeat watch ten years down the road? 
Once Upon a Time in Hollywood felt like an absolute labor of love from Quentin Tarantino. In my review, I compared Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to Roma in that this felt achingly personal to Tarantino. The one thing I love about Tarantino is his dialogue. His dialogue inspires me to write. He knows when to use profanity and when not to. He knows how to build tension without drawing a gun. I love everything about this film. This is a film where every actor on screen, even the extras, are giving 110%. Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth are characters that are so good, you wish they existed in real life. Even something as simple as DiCaprio and Pitt riffing an episode of the FBI that Rick appears in brings such joy to me, not to mention serving as a great tribute to Burt Reynolds, the way Tarantino handles Sharon Tate is so wonderful and so tasteful. Whenever Margot Robbie was on screen, I had the biggest smile on my face because I knew Sharon Tate was up there smiling that her legacy was treated with actual reverence and not as a symbol of victimhood. Ahem, asshole who counted every time a woman spoke in a Tarantino film. It's going to be a sad day when Tarantino releases his 10th film. But at the same time, Tarantino is a guy of respect because he wants to go on his own terms. And you can't help but appreciate that. I want to give a huge shout out to Peapod, Kayla Elizabeth, Vanessa Leonard, Ryan from Tropic Bombs for all helping me in with this video. Be sure to subscribe to all these awesome channels too and check out a story worth living. And until then... I'll see you next time, and let's have an awesome 2020.